Okay, we want to welcome you back to Rico Busters. We've got a very interesting show for you today. It's imperative that you stay with us. We've got Danielle Austin here. Danielle has been a victim of CPS corruption here in the state of Michigan. And we've got Ted Visner. Ted is a victim's rights advocate uh, and uh, somebody who is, uh, has got some very interesting information that you will not want to miss. Uh, today's topic is going to be dealing with Child Protective Services and uh, their involvement with child trafficking. Uh, how this scheme works and what you can do about it. Uh, so we, if you have a case that's similar, we hope that uh, during the break uh, you'll either pause or uh, go get your paperwork and uh, see what you can do to follow along with us and see if there's uh, some uh, uh, complexities of your case that are similar to that that we're going to be going over. Uh, we're going to be discussing in this, uh, and uh, feel free to, to break in here, um, that uh, the, the complexities of how the Michigan Supreme Court uh, acts um, to, to help to deprive parents of their rights and to give the government uh, more um, incentive and more um, inherent power to, uh, to, to deprive parents of their rights and to take their kids. We're going to demonstrate that uh, by the appointment of the court of, uh, of lawyers, of uh, uh, ineffective assistance of counsel, uh, that um, uh, children are being ripped away from their parents. We're going to be showing how uh, CPS government employees and judges and prosecutors and public defenders and even the paid lawyers are all operating together in a, in, in a cohesive fashion to operate criminally using cover, color of law uh, and court rules of procedure to conduct the unlawful abduction and trafficking of our children. Uh, these are our most valuable resources, as we know, or we should be knowing, because they are the future of this country. So, be sure to stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rico Busters. I want to thank you for coming back with us. Today is our topic of Child Protective Services and the abduction of our kids. Um, and uh, this is Danielle Austin. She's had her kids abducted from her uh, in a systematic fashion that we're going to be covering today. Uh, why don't we just get right into you describing your family situation, tell us how many kids you have, their ages, you know, how many days you've been away from them now and all that. Okay, um, well I have three. My oldest is Madison Austin. Um, she is 11. And then I also have Marcus, who is nine, and I have Michael, who is soon to be five this month. And um, we were, I, my ex and I were going through a separation, and um, I've always been a stay-at-home mom, um, you know, especially with Michael and his, and, you know, his problems and ne special needs that he has. Um, so I didn't have any income coming in. So for at least 11, 12 years, because you add another, uh, if uh, your oldest is 11 years old, and you add another year on to that for, for your term of pregnancy, at least for the last dozen years, you had not had a, a source of income other than through your husband, right? Right, correct. And, and so the, um... Uh, and and you haven't had work experience in those those period that period of time, and so uh, um, I can see your situation pretty clearly. <laughs> yes, um, so it was difficult because you know we had no money, and I didn't know, you know, what I was going to be able to do for them except for you know to get help through the state, and um, so you know ultimately that's what I had to do. I I, I went and applied for all the assistance that you know, I could get, um, including getting Michael's SSI restarted again. It had it previously before, but it's based on parents' income. Mm -hmm. So when it's too high, you get booted out, and that's what had happened. So I needed to reapply for that as well. And um, so um, 
I got all the paperwork together and filled it out and one of the requirements um, as well was um, to get a note from the pediatrician. Well, Ooh. now, bef uh, let's just get a little, ba a little bit more background about Michael. Uh, now, uh, from my understanding, Michael has severe food allergies. Yes. Michael has since been uh, recently been diagnosed with autism, but you had that that motherly intuition about that to begin with, as well as the food allergies. Um, uh, it's my understanding from our previous conversations that that there's a whole lot of Michael's condition that you were very familiar with as his mom and his caretaker on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis, uh, that um, that others weren't so familiar with and they certainly hadn't documented. Right. And so, um, uh, get us a little bit more familiar with these food allergies and, and, and you had mentioned also at Michael's birth or about the time of his birth that he went through surgeries and, and there was a lot of medical conditions. Yes. Um, I didn't know at the time that there was anything um, wrong with Michael, but he was watched very close um, while I was pregnant with him, but we, we never caught on or saw anything. So when he was born, um, he, he was six weeks early, and um, so he was premature. Mm -hmm. And um, I found out after recovery that, you know, the Life Flight team had already arrived in Mount Pleasant to take him to Ann Arbor. Um, because he had an imperforated anus and it required immediate attention. So, you know, that was the start of it. And, you know, since when I finally made it to Ann Arbor, I, I found out a bunch of other things. He had a heart condition um, and he had several holes in his heart. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there was a lot going on. And he, he's had nine surgeries altogether. Since his birth. Since his birth. Up through the age of four. Um, up to the age of almost three. Three. Okay. Yes. And then so. from three to four, he didn't have any surgeries in that time. No. Okay. And so, um, if you and I, I know this is sometimes discomforting, but do you do you feel like elaborating a little bit more about the types of surgeries that he had, and you know his his regurgitating or you know bringing things back up again and the and the types of things that they the doctors did to keep that from happening and now that might affect weight well um you know with his imperforated anus that that was a major ordeal although um there wasn't much that needed to be repaired um it was an intensive 14 months that i had to dilate his bottom every single day myself on top of that um, when he was about four months old he started having reflux problems and um, it just got more severe and more severe we went through all kinds of formulas to try you know to help him with that but nothing was working and it was getting to the point where it was scary you know I he was aspirating <sighs> consistently and we had numerous trips to Mount Pleasant Hospital to deal with that you know and even at Mount Pleasant Hospital and at the U of M they couldn't figure out why he was refluxing and and they had had him at the U of M in overnight studies and and never caught it so if they couldn't catch it they couldn't prove that there anything was going on what did they and, eventually do Jeff? well um you know Eventually, I, I'm on the phone for two weeks straight calling everybody that I can think of to help my son because it's getting so severe. And um, ultimately, we had a family outing and he, he was gone. He quit breathing. And, you know, at that point... That was we, before one year old? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he was taken back to the U of M. And of course, you know, the doctors are just, you know, we're so sorry, you know, we know that you've been saying something about this and we could never catch it, but we're going to do something about it now. So they, they put, they did a Nissen fund application, which is a band around the top of the stomach to, to keep him from refluxing. 
and then also add a G tube put in place, so that way his he would be fed through his stomach. So the the feeding through the stomach had to come because the reflux when they put a band around the top of his stomach it also not only keeps things from coming back up but it also keeps things from going back down. Well, going not necessarily down. going down, just more go, coming back up. That was the biggest concern because of the aspiration. But all with the time. that band on there, could he eat? Yes. He could yes. eat. Okay. Yes, he could eat. At, at that point, he was still drinking from a bottle. Mm-hmm. But when when they decided to put the G tube in place, um, he just he quit eating by mouth. I mean, just but you know you have to understand this was frightening to him mm-hmm. because he was choking all the time. You know, it was frightening, and he just didn't want to eat by mouth anymore because of everything that he had been going through. I understand. So, mm-hmm. you know, that ultimately stopped and you know, we that was a challenge in itself, but um, you know, he he had hearing problems. Um, he had tubes placed in and um, you know, he his other surgeries were, you know, undescended testicles. He also had a hernia. Um, he, he does still have one surgery that's remaining that has not been done and that's his heart surgery, but it's, it's never been of concern and the doctors are more than willing to wait for him to get older and stronger before, you know, attempting to do that. So you eventually brought him to a pediatrician and I know we'll be taking a break here in just a moment, but I'd like to, to, um, uh, and then we'll also talk when we come back about your uh, living conditions and the way things were at home at the time. And, and uh, you know, you being without money, uh, where your husband was at the time and things like that. Uh, but you eventually, ultimately, had brought your child at the age of four, which was, uh, this is being recorded here in uh, April of uh, 2015, it was about nine months ago or so mm-hmm. that you had taken your child to the um, uh, in July, right, yes. to to the pediatrician, and from that point, uh, CPS started getting involved, and at that point, things started rolling very rapidly downhill for you. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Well, we uh, will be right back in just a moment to uh, to see what those details are because we want our audience to know that you know this is not the first time I've heard this story this kind of story uh, about and 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 the basis for how our government is taking kids away from parents so we'll be right back hi and thank you for coming back with us here we are talking with Danny Austin uh, about uh, CPS abuses about the government taking kids away and trafficking these kids to other people and uh, uh, who are getting paid by the government to take care of other people's kids and, and basically it's a it's a, a condition that uh, has been raised with so many families that I've heard about where parents go for help from the government and they end up getting their kids taken away from them and uh, uh, with uh, the money and support for the kids going to other people, uh, when the laws are all stating that that uh, the, the the ones that uh, are supposed to be uh, the kids are supposed to be with are the parents, are the families, uh, and and certainly not with strangers and people who are in it for uh, a a financial package that comes from the government. Uh, where we left off, Dan, Danny was talking about um, the uh, the conditions of, of her kids. Uh, she's got one that's uh, 12 now, probably. 11. She's still 11. Um, 11, 9, nine and, and 5. five. And uh, Michael has a, a condition uh, that has been with him since birth, uh, demanding uh, really constant attention and um, uh, in, in all different areas. And so uh, with the, where we left off last, you had described that, uh, that uh, your youngest son of three, Michael, uh, now the, here in Isabella County of Michigan, that, uh, that he had, uh, was born with allergies, 
and what eventually was diagnosed as autism. Mm -hmm. And that just is the scratches the surface of the issues that he was going through since birth. And, uh, and that um, uh, I wanted to kind of get into uh, not so much the medical now, but the, the living conditions. And uh, you were a, a stay-home mom for 11 years or 12 years when you consider your first pregnancy. Uh, that um, uh, this, this was your job you know, taking care of your children. And so, you know, not only when CPS took your kids, they also took your job, you know. And uh, and so th this has devastated your family, it devastated your life, and uh, certainly has changed the lives of all of your kids. What was the, the living conditions like when, when well, this Well, like I said, um, my ex and I were in the middle of separation, and um, things were chaotic and crazy. Um, you know, I, I didn't have any money. Um, and so, you know, we were already running out of food and things that we needed. And it was hard to keep up with, with Michael's needs. Uh, a lot of, you know, what we were doing, we were paying out of pocket. Because, um, you know, insurance didn't cover very many things. And um, one of the primary things that they stopped taking care of was his food supply, um, his his bags and formula. You, I mean, you know, I got a letter from the insurance company saying that they knew it was a necessity, but that they weren't going to pay for it anymore. Wow. You know, so and you know, and you know, the food and everything else. I I was freaking out, trying to figure out, you know, how, you know, to to juggle all of this and you know, and still take care of my children and and Michael at the time was having um, um, pooping issues, bowel issues, and, um, you know, and it was, it, it was getting to the point where, you know, it needed attention, but at the time we didn't have insurance. And um, We're so talking I, about last July. Yes, last July. 2014. Okay. So, you know, I had already been in contact with Dr. Bordawalla, you know, about his problems, um, but um, I still needed to go to the state, so I went to the state, and I got, you know, all the assistance that I could possibly pull, you know, to be able to take care of my children. So, um, anyways, What about your house? You, you're, well, you were well, living the, in... Yeah, well, the other problem was is that the house was just falling apart. The, the plumbing wasn't working in the kitchen, and, um... This is the, the trailer that you're renting. Yes, and... So you had a landlord. Yes, that's supposed to be taking care of this. You were a little behind on your rent at the same time. Well, yeah. right, because I didn't have any money, so this was it was you know really becoming an issue. But the ce ceiling in the bathroom had caved in, um, due to hot water leak. So you know there there was so many different things going on. It 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 was completely awful. Mm -hmm. I mean it it was. It, you and, needed help. Yes. And so, who you know, who do you go for for help? You, you're tapping all the resources that you can, and eventually, I mean, you go to the doctor. The doctor can't supply everything. You go into the government, and um, so... So I know. got all the necessary paperwork and got everything together. Mm -hmm. um, Michael still hadn't seen Dr. Borderwell, because like I said, I didn't have insurance. And so we got all of that situated where, you know, we, we did, and I... Went to uh, Dr. Bordawalla, too, because I was applying for cash assistance as well, you know, um, to be able to stay at home with Michael. You Correct. Know? Mm -hmm. And um, You can't be leaving him alone when he needs somebody there to go work a job. Right. So, um, you know, she did approve the paperwork, but her concerns, you know, for Michael's weight loss because of, of his bowel issues, um, you know, she, she was the one that initiated the call to to CPS. That Dr. Bordawala? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. The um, female pe pediatrician? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how that began. And, you know, that was on a Tuesday. And, and two days later, I was meeting with CPS um, in their office, you know, talking about the situation with my son. And... Um, this is around just, July 20... Well, it? this was uh, like... July 2nd or 3rd. Mm -hmm. 
Um, by, so I had another follow-up appointment with Dr. Bordewell the very next week. Mm-hmm. And um, so she saw him, and um, he had lost two more pounds. Um, so, you know, it, it was really still starting to be... Still feeding tube. Right. Yeah. Still mm-hmm. has the feeding tube, still being fed, you know, continuous feeds. But for some reason, he was, he was losing weight. And she felt that, you know, it was in his best interest to be hospitalized at the U of M to figure out, you know, what was going on. So, you know, no problem. I mean, we've been here lots of times before. And she, um, and the doctor just doing what needs to be done by calling CPS, by saying this child needs some help, you know. The doctor doesn't know what's going on at home, you know. So there, as a teacher, I have to do the same thing. You know, if I, if I, I won't say suspect, but, you know, if there's a possibility that there is any negligence or anything going on at home just to make sure that, uh, that I'm covered and that the children are covered, you know, I'm doing a due diligence by, by making a call, you know, and I'm sure that that's what the, the doctor's motivation was, just, you know, call CPS and, and we got to get a team, you know, involved here to, to see what we can do about the health of the child. And so um, continue. I'm sorry. So, um, I, I took him myself to the U of M, you know, that, that day that he had seen the doctor. That's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, you know, he was there, we were there, um, for two weeks and, you know, with CPS being involved, they did every test imaginable, you know, went through back through his entire history. Um, you know, but the only issue that, you know, he had going on was, you know, his bowel issues. Um, so... Did they and ever we were, know what was causing him to lose the weight, or um, uh, you no, know? No, they they really didn't. I mean, you know, with him being autistic, he has severe stomach issues, mm-hmm. and he doesn't process nutrients properly. And then when you have bowel problems on top of that, because a lot of your um, nutrients are absorbed through the colon mm-hmm. as well. So if you don't have both of those factors working, you just basically have food going in and food going out. Got it. So you're not utilizing any of the nutrients that mm-hmm. you've got going on. So that was more, you know, Michael's problem. So they did all of their testing and, and, and got everything situated with him. And then um, by the end of the two weeks, um, they released Michael back to me to be able to go home. And so U of M had every opportunity... Uh, and they took every opportunity to to make sure that 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 Michael's needs were taken care of, that all evaluations were done, that any so they have U of M. You told me that they have their own CPS. Yes, I I met with him while I was there. Right, and and, and, and you know they introduced themselves and and told me the possibilities that you know they could step in as well. You know, when they would be doing their own investigation while he was there. So you know, I already knew you know, that that was taking place. And it, my God, it felt like I was on CPS floor because, you know, every other room was a CPS case, um, you know. And so, so I, I was very well aware of what the possibilities were, you know, because if they step in, I he wouldn't be released to me. Correct. And the, he, yet he was. Right. At the end of that two-week period, uh, that uh, their CPS had every opportunity to do their evaluation. They took that opportunity. All the medical needs were taken care of, and they hand your child back back to you, and they say, you know, uh, follow up. Well, yes, and of course I, you know, had to do follow up with with everyone about you know Michael's cares and needs that you know were going to be looked after once he left the hospital. Um, I did have. Um, a discussion with one of the nurses about the in-home uh, nurse that would be coming in the very next day after leaving, you know, the U of M, um, so they could monitor his weight and, in, you know, and anything else that they needed. Um, but I specifically asked her if she, if it could be set back a day, so instead of being on Tuesday, it could be on Wednesday. Was this by um, phone? No, this was in person in that person. I was I was talking with this nurse. And um, she said that she would see what she could do. She didn't tell me yes or no, you know, but that somebody would be getting back with me and letting me know, you know, if it could be possible. Um, you know, and because of the condition of, of my home, and I already knew that it was going to be repaired. 
Um, so they had your landlord did commit to a repair. Right. And uh, I and had been already previously talking with him about you know that it, it needs to be done, you know, and um, so he was finally going to be able to do it. And my other thing too was getting it set up, you know, somehow not to be there because I can't be there while the repairs are going on, um, and you know, so my parents had already paid for two weeks in a hotel, you know, awesome. for me to stay. So, you know, it was about a process of getting everything set up, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to and you do what I needed that. to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, anyways, um, so we came home on the 21st that evening, like at 1030 at night. And the very next morning, CPS is knocking at my door. And... You know, I, I opened the door and I'm talking to her and she was like, well, you know, I need to come in and inspect your home and this and that and whatever. And I, you know, I said, it's not a really good time right now. You know, I, I, I've, we just got back and I've got things that I got to take care of. You know, um, I said, I, I'm in the process of getting out of this place, um, you know, because there's repairs that need to be done in the bathroom and, and plumbing. And she just insisted it wouldn't take no for an answer. It's it's going to happen now, you know. I can just see this this <laughs> government employee, say, you know, just shoving you aside and walking right past you. It's going to happen well, that way. Well, that's pretty much how it happened. So, you know, and she she did her assessment. You know, of course, taking the pictures yep. there. They're all look at the mess. Look at the mess. Oh yeah, yeah. a big hole in the roof. You know, yeah, taking notes, <laughs> and um, so you know. By the end of this visit, you know, she's telling me, well, you know, I, I think that you're you're a good mom. And, you know, I, I had Michael in my arms at that time. And she's like, I can see that Michael, you know, really loves you and trusts you. So, you know, we're going to give you a chance. And, you know, and not step in. We're going to implement family first. And, um, you know, which... For all of how long? <laughs> <laughs> you know... They didn't say that this was a 12-hour venture with family first or whatever. Right. I mean, get into that. That's but, a, I mean, you know, I... This I is mean, this is a scary thing, law. you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, you don't really know what's going to take place and happen. You, you know, these people are already threatening to take away your children. But, you know, there's that chance that, you know, they're going to give you and bring in someone, you know. So... <sighs> By 3 o'clock um, that afternoon, Family First, you know, came and was in my home. And, you know, they sat down and formulated a plan, you know, to help me get myself back, you know, on my feet to be able to take care of my children, you know, with everything that was going on, you know. July 21st. 22nd. This 22nd. Is the, this is the 22nd, the okay. very next day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'm hopeful, you know, that things are gonna be okay and then um on the 23rd I get a phone call at 10 o'clock in the morning from Stephanie Smith who CPS. is CPS mm -hmm. who is upset with me because she found out that I had tried to move the in-home nurse from Tuesday to Wednesday and you know, that's I, the deal breaker. But well, you know, and that's what she had said, you know, but oh I had already gosh. previously talked with her the day before when she was at my home, mm -hmm. letting her know of the repairs. And, you know, and she's telling me, well, this is negligence on your, por your One part. Day. Yeah, this is this is abuse that you that you have moved an in-home nurse scheduling from one day to another. It's almost as rational as moving from a place that's not fit to live in to a place that's a hotel, right? That, that, that while the repairs are being done in your home. That's a perfectly rational reason to start in-home servicing at a different place, right? Right, because I, I mean, I wasn't going to be there for at least two weeks. So, you know, I'm hearing this from her and I'm, you know, when she's sitting there telling me, you know, well, we're going to step in and we're going to take your kids, you know. And, and the other reason, too, was was that there was two doctor appointments. I had a follow-up with his regular pediatrician, Dr. Bordawala. But there was another um, U of M appointment that had been scheduled previously before him being in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and it was at the U of M at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I had Dr. Bordawala at noon. And, you know, there was all kinds of craziness and, you know, and I had to miss that appointment at the U of M. 
Um, well, you and that was one of the thing that she was upset with me about was that there was a missed appointment. You know, she's sitting there telling me, you blew all your chances. You missed an appointment and you tried to move the in-home nursing. She was like, that's that's it in my book. Well, the, the, U of M is two and a half hours away, isn't it? Yes. And, and so uh, you can't be there and then be back in two hours to another doctor's appointment. Right. So you're just keeping a single doctor's appointment with his, your uh, immediate you know, physician. Right. So, you know, Stephanie is telling me that she's going to step in and take my children. But, of course, the initial step is that the children get placed with the grandparents uh, or with a relative. Yeah. And in, in my case, it was the grandparents. Um, which is which nonetheless is my, my, taking your kids away right. from you. Right. Um, so. My ex's family is the one that lives here in Michigan. I, I don't have any family here in Michigan. But, you know, so I was trying to set it up with her. And all the while, I'm just, I'm crying because this is just blowing my mind that she would take this step against me when I was already trying to be responsible in the first place and doing what was best for me and my, my children. You know, um, To so, me, that's abuse. It's an abuse of authority. It's for somebody to say, hey... We're going to step in. We're going to take over your life. We're taking over your children's lives. And, oh, by the way, we'll cut you a little bit of slack. We'll, we'll, we'll throw you a bone. We'll, we'll help you out. We'll, you know, we'll give you one more chance. And then to take that away the very next day. Right. Yeah, you know, I see it. So, you know, I, I got it set up. And, um, you know, and I told her, I said, well, you know, he still has an, an appointment with Dr. Borowala. And she agreed that I could take him there. and But that, you know, he needed to go to the grandparents after it was done and you know so I get Michael ready and we go see Dr. Bordawalla and after the appointment um, as I'm walking outside to go back to the car I get another phone call from her, from her and she says well you know change the plans you have court at three and she changed the plan at the last minute the CPS yes Stephanie Smith Smith yes so here I am just going, <laughs> okay, I have to go to court for what? You know, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, and this is so, track number one. Track number two gets laid down, and the ball is going to start rolling here once you get to the court. Right. Which we will have to discuss when we get back. Welcome back to Rico Busters. I'm David Scheid, and I'm here talking with Danny Austin. And the subject for today, child trafficking. Where we left off, uh, we had talked about how CPS comes into a person's home and extracts their kids under color of law. Uh, and we want to talk a little bit more about, you know, what... Uh, what other people, what other organizations, uh, other professionals, what their views are, even your husband, what, what those people's views are of CPS and other government agencies that have the power to uh, do everything from uh, taking the kids to taking parents' income and you know taking federal money and, and things like this in order to facilitate what their program has to offer. Well, like I said, um, you know, we were um, separated, and he he had moved out. Um, he, we were trying to do the best, m me and my kids, we, you know, we're trying to do the best that we could. Um, you know, at this point, he had control over the money, and he was back out working and, and maintaining a, an apartment in Pennsylvania um, out there. Um, he, he did not want me to go to the state for help, um, just because of, you know, child support and other things. And so, child um, support, he, wait, <clears throat> he's not really, I just want to clarify that it would seem that a father's, as a mother's best interest is in the welfare of a child. And if you're, if you're talking about going to state agencies, long before you actually did, 
uh, you know, it, it, it's because, and you didn't, it's because your husband is telling you that he doesn't want you to. Right, that's correct. And he doesn't want you to because he's he doesn't want to have anybody come after him for child support. And he's telling you that you've got he's got expenses. You know, was he in or out of the home at that time? Had you kicked it, him? He wasn't living there. You know, at the time, and you know he really wanted it to just be kept between 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 us. You know, and. Um, but it's not because your kids are involved and your kids need some help and you need some help. Right. And, you know, he was helping out periodically, but, you know, with us being so behind on everything, that, you know, that was going on, it, it wasn't enough mm -hmm. to keep us afloat and, you know, to, to be able to do what we needed to do. You know, so it was really frustrating, you know. Um, and he, you know, like I said, he was working out in Pennsylvania and, and he was gone. Um so, you know, at, at that point... Um, well, let, let's talk a little bit more about what other people are, their views. Um, you said that uh, during the break here that when, when family first came in, you know, that they also had a, a view, you know, this is, what, this is not third-party information, but this is directly told to you by the family first about... Uh, go well, ahead. You know... You know they they were you know sympathetic and you know and, and hate to see any family go through this you know um you know, their thoughts and views were that you know they don't agree with how CPS operates and and what they do you know about keeping the family together you know they seen so many cases where you know they, things shouldn't have gone the way that they that they did and it was very frustrating to them so, and yeah. that was told to you directly yes. by the person that, that is, has come to you and talked to you right. uh, from family first. And which, by the way, as we learned in the last little section here before the break, is that um, that this only lasted, what, 24 hours or less than that? This family first involvement? Right. right. Before this person, uh, CPS, <clears throat> Stephanie Smith, comes in. And, and let's also go back to the, the way that... Um, that Stephanie Smith had delivered her will give you a last opportunity at this. You know, that wasn't really a discretionary move by her because the, it, it is, in fact, the law that says that family first must be brought in as a last alternative before CPS is granted the ability to do something else. But right. that's not how she delivered it to you, is it? No, it was more like I'm doing you a favor, you know. And, and it, it, you know, her whole attitude, it, it was not about helping and being there and preserving the family, you know. Um, and it wasn't about the law either, from no. what I'm understanding. That that she's she's making she's portraying herself towards you as this this powerful um, you know government entity that can do whatever they want, but out of her own graciousness that she you know. <laughs> Am right. I right? And, <laughs> yes, you're completely right. You know, and, and that's that's not, you know, a, a government official should be out there saying that here's what the law says. We are bound by the law. And here's what the law says, that we must bring in this, this you know, this is not our discretion to give you this opportunity. This is what the law says. This is what the legislators have said that, that needs to be done on behalf of the, the people themselves and to benefit the people. Mm -hmm. And and obviously she didn't, in t less than 24 hours time, she didn't give you the opportunity to even work with family first. Right. So, you know, getting back to that, you know, she's calling me at 10 o'clock telling me that, you know, they're going to make their move, but they're going to, you know, try to find relative placement. And, you know, all the while I still needed to take Michael to, you know, his doctor appointment. And, um, and I, I was a wreck. I, you know, I was crying and, um, you know, I, I was talking with Dr. Bordawala, you know, and she was asked, you know, to, well, she was telling me, you know, how good Michael looked. He looked, you know, better you know, from what he was going through, and, um, 
This is the wanted. appointment that you made it at, uh, uh, that was two hours later than the one that was scheduled in right. U of M, and you couldn't make that one, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get back to your primary physician. Right. And, uh, you know, she was asking me how things were going with CPS, and, and I just, I lost it. I started crying. I said, they're, they're taking my children away. And she just had this shocked look on her face, and she, she said, no, no, this is not what I wanted. Michael needs to stick with you. Um, you know, she, he has too many needs, and you're the one that knows how to handle and do everything. She's like, this is, this is not what I wanted. And she offered, you know, to make a phone call to Stephanie Smith, you know, about this. But, you know, they had already made up their mind at what they wanted to do. So, you know, anyways, um, going on, I, you know, I step out of the office. I get a phone call from Stephanie Smith, and she's telling me that there is a change of plans and that I need to be at court at 3. And... So again, just that was like two hours later. If if your appointment was around noon time, right? Yeah. You know, again, I'm hit with something else. Going okay, I don't know what's going on. And now I got to go to court. You know, for what? I don't. I don't understand. So I get done from Doctor Borderwall's office, and I take Michael directly over to the grandparents' house, and I, um head back to Mount Pleasant to go to my court hearing and I, I'm just a mess. You know, I, I I live here in Michigan by myself with no family support um, because none of them live here. This is all my ex's family that live here. And I'm sitting here thinking, what do I do? I mean, who do I call? Because I don't know what's going to happen here. And it, you know, and it just, it scared me. So, you know, I, I make it to the courthouse, and, and I'm sitting in the waiting room, and this guy walks up to me and introduces himself as Tony Moses, and that he's my court-appointed attorney. And I'm, okay. And he says, okay, we need to take a few minutes to, to talk. Now, so he didn't go, know anything, obviously. Go go ahead. No, but he, he, no he didn't. Um so, you know, we, we go into this room, and, and he starts reviewing the case right along with me. For the first I, time. For the first time, and I'm trying to tell him my story about what's gone on, what I've been going through, you know, what I've been trying to do, and, you know, and, and he's just basically telling me, well, you know, none of that matters now, and, you know, what, what we got to do is just, is basically just go along with them at this point, you know, and... I, I'm looking at him and I'm saying, you know, you're supposed to be representing me. You're supposed to be giving me advice as to what, you know, I can do for my case. And you're just telling me that I just need to go along because it's, that's in the best interest of the kids. And without him knowing anything about you, about him knowing anything about your kids, without him knowing anything about the case other than a quick review of whatever CPS has put in there, and you haven't even had a chance to look at that, right? Right. So, you know, we get done speaking there for five, six minutes, and it's already time to go into court. And, and um, anyways... I'm just sitting there, and they're discussing the petition, you know, to be able to take my children, and I'm not understanding everything that's going on. I am in such a daze, for one, that I'm even here at this point, going through all of this, well, and I not understanding anything that's being take, taken place. Um... And I think what's important to understand here is that it's not supposed to play out like this. By the law, this is not supposed to play out like this. This You are being placed in this situation by a scheme. that And, and you didn't know this. You didn't recognize the scheme. And there, there's, a, there's a reason why this isn't supposed to happen to you like this. 
And that is because we have laws, we have Michigan court rules and other things put into place that are supposed to give you due process rights. And you have, you're so overwhelmed here because you've had your due process rights stripped away from you and, uh, and by uh, uh, entities that are defying and going against the stuff that they know or should know they're supposed to be doing and they aren't doing those things. Good example, case in point here, is that Danielle was uh, explain in your own words that you never received any paperwork until after the hearing and that this hearing was held on the same day of of the judge signing and and, and, uh, can you go over a little of that? Well, like I said, I, I didn't know anything. You know, I wasn't advised of anything or, you know, Other none than of that was right. You know, so here I am sitting in court and they're presenting this petition, you know, to take the children. And, and I'm just sitting here in, in disbelief going, this can't happen like this. You know, this just doesn't seem right and it shouldn't at all. Be. And, you know, the, the hearing took about, you know, 10 minutes and, and it was all said and done. And I'm sitting here just... Said and done that the kids were out of your hands. They were no longer in your... Right. Yes. And um, my world is turned upside down, you know. And, and it wasn't until after, you know, the hearing that I, you know, was handed the paperwork, you know, concerning everything that we went over. And um, it wasn't until, you know, reviewing the paperwork later, you know, that there there was a summons, you know, and... Um, it was the summons that that was handed to you, but after the hearing. But after the hearing. And, and, and uh, go ahead. You know, you and, and that, you know, it was supposed to be given to me seven days prior and not three minutes before the hearing. And also, too, you know, the petition to have the children removed, you know, from my care and out of my home was, in fact, denied. Um, because the At hearing, that hearing? Yes, because it, the hearing was adjourned for lack of notice to my ex, who was not there. Okay, so that hearing that was held on the, this is, we're talking about July 24th, right? 23rd. Or 20, 23rd. And, and Stephanie is is looking at me and telling me, you know, okay, you need to go home and you need to gather all of Michael's stuff up. And I, I was so upset. I've been Michael's caregiver since he was born. I know everything about him, everything. We have barely spent any time apart. He's never spent the night away from me. And anybody that's known me has known that Michael's always been right there by my side. I mean, we we have a special connection because we've been through hell and back together in everything. And he's my best pet. I I am well, so close with him. And to think that he's not going to be with me anymore, and he, my other two as well. I mean, they're taking my life away from me because my kids are my life is well that's what i've been doing and and i don't think you need to say any more because what we want to do when we come back is we want we're going to invite uh ted um visner back into this conversation here and um give you a chance to take a little break and um uh We'll be right back. You have just heard the first-hand account of what happened to Danielle Austin and the totality of her interactions with Child Protective Services before they acted to forever change her life and the lives of her three children. In the next segment, we will be tearing apart the laws and the court rules to show you exactly what makes these people think that they can get away with the foul, evil deeds that they are doing and what we can do as a people to stop them dead in their tracks. Stay tuned. You definitely don't want to miss what's coming up next. (music) 